hey, so we're gonna do how to be an artist and not lose your mind. This is not just me talking, and I hope you guys get involved and share your experiences too. So let me tell you a little bit about myself. I grew up in the Lower East Side on 6th Street between A and B in a legalized squat. I feel very comfortable in this bookstore. I've been coming here for a long, long time. And I'm inside a library, I'm 15 years old. I'm alphabetizing files. And I'm thinking to myself, if I gotta do this the rest of my life, I'm gonna shoot myself in the fucking head. So I made up rule number one, no working nine to five. And I made up rule number two, only do what you love. And the wheel keeps on turning. Now I'm 25, I'm juggling fire in Washington Square Park. That's what happens when you don't have a day job. And the wheel <laughs> keeps on turning. Then I decided I wanted to be a stand-up comic. <laughs> so I spent years learning the craft of comedy. I'm Master Lee. I'm from faraway China. Town. <laughs> Took me two years to figure out that joke and two more years to figure out the pause. I used to rush it. I'm Master Lee. I'm from faraway China. Town. I'm Master Lee. I'm from faraway China. Town. <laughs> Took me two years to figure out I'm from faraway China. Dot, dot town, right? So then after that, I decided I wanted to take a cut and pay. So I decided I'm gonna write a play with my friend Andy, who's right over there. So we wrote a play called Cruel and Unusual, a death penalty game show. It's a dark, it was Mamiya Bougemont, Timothy McVeigh, and a, I don't know what you call him, a retarded prisoner are vying for who gets executed in a game show format. And the play was so dark that I lost my partner. She said, I can't handle it, and she left. And then after that, I played Salvador Dali. I was a performance artist. Genius! I'd pull dead fish from my pants and do dances to Swan Lake with them. And then after that, I decided I wanted to change the way I performed. So I went to the Oracle, my pot dealer. And I said, I want to smoke every pot you got. He's like, everyone? Yeah took notes. First one, fruity, light, nice. Second one, ooh, kind of couch lock. Third one, forgot about the pen and paper. Fifth one, sixth one. Then the music slowed down. I could see the notes coming out of the speaker, so I'm like, damn. I want that one. He's like, how much? I go, all of it. All of it? So I bought an ounce and a half of weed. And I'm smoking the weed through a vaporizer. And I'm listening to Martin Luther King Jr. speeches. Headphones. That's my warm-up music, Martin Luther King. <laughs> then I'd go on stage. Yeah. <laughs> Let's do this. I want to talk about the highest high. The 10 best things that ever happened to me. Number one, I'm living in a tree house in Thailand with my partner and the wheel keeps on turning. Then I hit 50. 50? People say, you don't look 50. I go, I have a solution to stress. Don't do things you don't want to do. That takes a lot of stress out of your life. I said, I don't want to have a boss. I don't have a boss. It takes stress out of your life. And then I surveyed artists. I surveyed 150 artists. I said, what are the three biggest challenges in your life? Number one was money. Number two was business issues. Number three was creative. So let me tell you a little bit of story about this and we'll get into a quick exercise. I went to a more experienced performer, he's from San Francisco, and I said, tell me about popular entertainment. I was a teenager. He goes, all right, well, first of all, it's called show business. It's not called show. It's not called show show. It's called show business. I go, wow. Does that mean it's 50% show? 50% business? He goes, oh no. It's more like 80% business and 20% show. <laughs> yeah, all right. Then I saw a show and it sucked. <laughs> so I try to make it 50-50. But for you, everybody write down what percentage of time and effort you spend on the art and what percentage of time you spend on the business. Okay, so just write that down. If you don't have a pen and paper, put up your hand and I got one more. All right, just come up front.
Right. You guys all got that? Is that it? All right. Now, here's the thing. Your percentage can be anything, right? But look, look at the number, right? Look at the number of what percentage you do in art, percentage you do in business, and are you happy with that number? Are you happy with the percentage, you know? And if you're not, you make a change. I want to talk a little bit about stage fright and about writer's block. I'm doing a street show in Washington Square Park. So that's what I do. This woman comes up to me from NYU and she goes, you want to lecture my class? I'm like, all right, well, how much does it pay? She goes, $125 an honorarium. I'm like, hmm. that seems low compared to what they're paying, but all right, $125 on a weekday. And I had three weeks to prepare. They gave me an hour and four, 15 minutes, right? And he said, so I'm thinking to myself, what is the best thing I can teach performance studies to these NYU kids, right? And I thought stage fright, that's like the most important thing. I'm at the Village Gate, which is now Poisson Rouge on Bleecker Street. And I'm about to do 10 minutes, right? It's the first time I ever did 10 minutes of stand-up, and I'm sweating. It was stage fright, right? And I'm splashing water on my face and I'm throwing up into the trash can. I'm like, splashing water on my face. I'm like, oh my God, I gotta do 10 minutes. I'm gonna embarrass myself. And then I looked in the mirror, I'm like, hold on, you're Master Lee. You don't throw up. <laughs> and I just said my name over and over, my stage name. I, Master Lee. I, Master Lee. I, Master Lee. All right, showtime. <laughs> so what I found is, you can build yourself up, like, I'm gonna destroy this crowd, you know? You build yourself up so big, you have so much power. Other people diminish the crowd. I wanna look at them like they're naked, right? And it took me years to figure out I could just match the energy of the audience. I could match the energy of the audience, then take them on a trip. So stage fright for me is, you're basically giving the audience too much power. <laughs> Why should you care? Why should I care what you people think? I don't know most of you, fuck you. I mean, not really fuck you, but kind of fuck you. you know? Why should you stop me from doing the best show I can do, right? So that's what it is for me. So I'm writing this book called How to Be an Artist and Not Lose Your Mind. And I get to, it's supposed to be 90,000 words. That's what people want, right? So I'm like, all right, I'm gonna write 1,000 words a day for 90 days, the whole winter. And then that will be the first draft. And I couldn't really do it until I talked to this one professor. And she says, find the ideal audience. Find the ideal audience you want to write for. The, the ideal audience you want to perform for, right? So I found the ideal person I wanted to write for. And then it became easy. So we're going to do a little exercise. This is a thought web. Do you guys know what a thought web is? All right, I'll show you. I thought, well, this is like, a, my partner taught me this. You take, you take the word that you want to do the thought web about it, and let's, everybody put fear in the middle of your, like this, any way you want, upside down, that way. Fear, right? And then the first thing that comes to your mind, because this is, you know, I'm not grading you, I'm not even going to look at your paper, you know? And just draw a thought, like what's connected to fear. Then draw another spoke. Then I draw another spoke until there's spokes all around the fear. Yeah. So work on that for a little bit. Okay. All around there's spokes. <coughs> then when you finish doing the spokes, you take the first one, like stage fright, and you draw three more spokes off the stage fright, and just fill up the whole page. Should take like maybe five minutes, so I'm gonna sit here and drink tea. Mm -hmm. <coughs> So 
now, now look at your page, right? You have all these things written down. Now, take a minute, a moment, and circle the three most important things, the three most important things on the page. Whatever they are, circle three. All right, this next exercise is easier. Turn the page. And put in the middle of the page, art. <laughs> so this is all the benefits of your art. And just start doing the same kind of thought web spoke thing. Just put art in the middle. And the first thing that comes to your mind, just write down the benefits of your art. So now look at look at your art chart and just circle the three most important things. All right, if you finish that, take Take your three biggest fears, right? The three biggest fears you circled, and just write them down at, on another page, your three biggest fears. Right? Whatever they are, just write them down. And then across from the fears, write the benefits of art. Okay? So on the left side, fears, and the right side will be a benefit of your art. Sometimes they exactly oppose each other, sometimes they don't. It's just more for you. And after you put the ones on the left and the ones on the right, look at how they <coughs> relate to each other. Or do they relate to each other? <laughs> Did you learn something about your fears? Did you learn something about your what you think is the benefit of art. You all got that? I did. did anybody learn anything? Yeah. Uh, what you, what'd you learn? Just yell it out, is a room. What'd you learn back there? Uh, I don't know how to say it yet. Okay. It's like polar opposites. So somewhere polar opposites, like what would you have? Like polar uh, desperation, hope, confinement, creativity, no one cares, bringing positive changes to the world and stuff. Like, I don't, I guess I'm bipolar. <laughs> <laughs> just got diagnosed in this class. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Best therapy well, ever. <laughs> great. <laughs> uh, I, I know people who are bipolar, and they said, the psychiatrist said, uh, make sure you're getting at least seven hours of sleep. If you're not getting seven hours of sleep, then you might have to deal with it. Anybody else <laughs> learn anything? What's that? You did you learn something? Right there when you said that. The seven hours of sleep? Yeah, well, I just dealt with a lot of situations. Uh, yeah, what, what do you got? The, the reason for doing art kind of solves the fears, like they fix them. Solving fears? Yeah. yeah. And what's the, oh, so you, your solution is solving fears? Like no, the, the solution for like the fears that I had came through the reasons why I do art. We, do you mind telling us a few reasons? Sure, yeah. So my fears were like disappointing family and friends, failure. Um, oh, and my other one was not succeeding, which is kind of like failure, I guess. And so the reasons for doing art was not being as, stre as stressed, more in touch with like my feelings and what's going on, and I can take advantage of alternative 
like opportunities of living my life. So that kind of like solved some of what I was. Yeah, the, the family thing is a heavy thing. I never, <laughs> I never t totally felt free until both my parents died. So there you go. They say if you think you're enlightened, go live with your parents for two months. <laughs> See what happens. Right, in the front, what do you got? You, know, art you have to talk kind of loud. Cause right. Art is directly opposed to the fear of decay and the limited time that you have because it allows you life extension. It allows you to go into realms that are inhibited by possibility and it allows you to create things that will survive beyond you. Yeah, that's... I think maybe the fourth or fifth most common thing people talk about was time. Yeah. Like when I said, what are your three biggest challenges? A lot of people said time, I don't have enough time, the time I have, I don't know how to manage it. So I'll tell you a little bit of story about that and maybe we'll go on with that. So uh, everybody loves Raymond, right? I'm hanging out with them and I'm saying, how do, you, how do you write? You have like, you know, five kids, you know? And he goes, well, I have this thing I call the magic hour. He goes, from five in the morning to six in the morning when the kids aren't awake, nobody's awake except for me. That's my time to write comedy from five to six. It's a magic hour. And he goes, I get more done in that one hour than when I was single and had no kids. You know, sometimes you impose a deadline on yourself and it actually opens up things. My joke is, you know what the be best deadline is? Death. <laughs> All right. I imposed a deadline. I said, I want to write a thousand words for 90 days to finish my first draft of my book, and I did it. So some days were rough, I'd only write 200 words, and then the next day I'd have to write 1,800 words. And I'm like, I better write 1,800 because I don't want to get behind and have to write 2,400, you know? It's crazy. So, so the time management, okay, so there's a couple tools that I use. One is called the Pomodoro Technique. You can look it up, you can buy his book if you want or not. Yeah, you're gonna everything on the website. Basically, you set a timer for 20 minutes, right? And you can, help yourself 20 minutes, you can do 20 minutes, and then you take a five minute break. Then you do another 20 minutes. Then you take a five minute break. When you do four of them, then you take a longer break, like 25 to 30 minutes. And people tell me there's this app called Freedom. You guys know that one? Where it turns off all your internet. <laughs> you can't check social media, you can't check your email for a certain amount of time, whatever time you put in there. And it frees you up from social media, so that's, that's one of the ways I deal with time, and I'm a big fan of having a deadline. I think Andy and me wrote a play in like five weeks or something. It was crazy amount of time, but so that's time. Did anybody else have some insights on uh, your fear versus your benefit art, or did you do something else? All right, this next piece is, um, I have an older brother, so I'm always worried about um, being the best. So I'm always, I was always concerned when I was in my 20s about being talented or being a genius. I was like, I don't wanna do it unless I'm talented at it or I'm genius, I'm gonna be the best at it. Until one day, I took a hit of mescaline. <laughs> and I'm lying underneath a tree in my favorite botanical garden. First of all, it's my favorite. I go to many botanical gardens. <laughs> this is my favorite one. I'm lying there, staring at a tree. Wow, that's like Whitman beautiful. <laughs> Look at that. The perfect light is coming through the leaves and the branches. It's like amazing. There are no geniuses. That's just one person comparing themselves to the other people. Nature is genius. Got it worked out. <laughs> then an hour goes by. I'm like, oh, hold on. We are part of nature. Hmm. So I do what I do. I go to my friend, he writes for Sesame Street. I go, he must know the answer. I go, I <laughs> <laughs> with kids, write scripts with kids. And I go, how do you deal with talent and genius? He goes, first of all, you can't control talent and genius unless you drink a lot of ginkgo biloba, right? Why don't you concentrate on what you can control? like your work habits. <laughs> that hit me like a fucking lightning bolt in the middle of the head. I was like, oh shit. Then I looked at my work habits. I'm like, 
I'm a sloppy motherfucker. <laughs> I take mescaline and hang out in gardens. <laughs> Surely this is not the most potential I can get out of my potential. <laughs> so what we're gonna do is we're gonna identify our intention, okay? So what is your intention in art? What do you wanna feel? What do you want the audience to feel? Let's define your intention. So take a couple minutes and write down your intention. Or intentions, it's plural. Once you think you got your intention, make it even more specific. What's the layer below that? Like, if you say I want to be successful, that's really broad. Why do you want to be successful? What's the root of that? Okay. So try to get underneath what you think your intention is now. What's the root of that? Then go to what's the root of that root. And keep on going. Go layers down. Go deeper until you can't go anymore and then you're all staring at me. Here's another question. What do you want your audience to feel when they see, write, experience your art? So it's not just your intention. What's your intention for your audience? What kind of bridge are you building? I'm gonna talk a little bit while you guys keep on writing if you want to. Uh, when I was doing street shows, I wanted my show to be like The Simpsons, right? I wanted it to be like an eight-lane highway, you know? If you're blind, you're gonna get something on my show. If you're deaf, you're gonna get something. If you don't speak English, if you didn't go to college, you didn't go to high school, I wanted everybody to get something. I didn't want it to be like an ivory tower where yeah. only 10 people understand what I'm doing, you know? Because it's a street show. You know? So for you, what do you consider, like, after your show, after your exhibit, after your book, after your poem? What do you want to leave the audience with? Like, like, yeah. Now, once you, like, you know, you're going to take these pages home. You'll leave me the pens and the pads, because I have other <laughs> workshops to do. But like what? No free pads. Yeah, no free pads, man. <laughs> <I'm sure. laughs> so what I can leave you with, it, which is the best thing, I think, is the next step, okay? So once you clarified your intention, then think in a baby steps. Break it down to the smallest step. What is the next thing you can do immediately, like here or when you get home or on the train, whatever? What's the next step you can take? to get the ball rolling towards your intention. So just write down in a baby step what that is. Okay. And when you got that, write down even a smaller step than that. Like if you're saying, you know, hey, I wanna write a book, right? Okay, that's a gigantic thing. What's a smaller step? I wanna write a page. What's smaller than that? I wanna, you know, write a word. How many words do you wanna write a day? Make it really small. Crazy small. I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, things that keep us, or keep me from getting my intention. The Buddhists talk about the chattering mind, right? You left the stove on, your girlfriend's cheating on you, you're not good enough, blah, 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 blah. It's this chattering mind, it's like tape loops going on in your head, multi-track tape loops going on in your head. It prevents you, there's too much chatter, you know. We live in a very neurotic city. Carl Jung said, neurosis is always a substitute for legitimate suffering. It's so good I remember I said it. Neurosis is always substitute for legitimate suffering. So there's been times I didn't want to write the book and I'm like, well, why aren't you facing it? Are you gonna do the book or not do the book? Are you willing to suffer for this thing? 
And then on the other hand, we have the starving artist myth. We'll, we'll get into it in a minute. That's another issue. But here we go. So you guys all got your baby step and then a smaller baby step? Anybody want to share one of their steps? Only if you can give me an answer. I don't know about that. I'm not a guru. So, but what do you got? Um, make work for more people than myself. Like, for example, like I think my, one of my biggest motivations in making work is just I make it for myself more than I make for an audience, typically. I mean, I have shows, but like, how what, do I do what that? What type of art do you do? Everything. Can you be more specific? Well, like, like painting, do do? smoke drawings, performance, film, play, I've written plays as well. And like, I think it can reach a broader gasp, but I'm not thinking of the audience when I make my work, so. Okay. I guess like on a business front, that's why mm -hmm. I'm really poor. Uh, I'm doing a thing where I'm trying to build, they call it my writer's platform, you know, like to try, like I'm, I almost look at them as separate, but they're not separate, the show and the business. So do, that's complex. I mean, the, the first thing I would say is take it to the streets, but not everything can be done in the yeah. streets, right? So first of all, are you members of collectives? Do you have like a, do you have an art tribe? Do you, do you want an art trap? I, I don't work well in Okay, so you don't you don't want an art trap. I've kind mm -hmm. of have tried. It doesn't, my personality doesn't work out. Okay. I mean, th there's different ways to build build a platform of people who, Yeah. I mean. You think that's probably like one of the goals? Is okay, like, I talked to this great. Sorry, I don't. No, no, no. Talk I talked to this great <laughs> publicist, music publicist, and, and, he, and I go, well, you know, what can somebody do to get their music out there? And he goes, is he surprised me? He goes, go to more parties. You know, that might not be your thing, but mm -hmm. he said, go to more parties. I was like, wow, that's it? Yeah, go to more parties and meet people, you know? You're here, right? Mm -hmm. We could take five or 10 minutes and everybody, or 15 minutes, everybody could greet each other and you could meet people, you know? It's... But is this, would this be considered my audience? Aren't these my peers? You know, wouldn't these be like considered my contemporaries? I, th I think first of all, like in the beginning, usually, in my experience, your peers are your audience, <laughs> you know? And if you if you do well with your peers, then your peers are like, check this show out. I mean, how do you find out about most shows? Well, they don't buy, I mean, I wouldn't expect anyone to support me financially. That's also like an artist. Never mind. Well, we can get into the okay, starving art. We can get into the starving artist myth and, and the Protestant work ethic. If you want. All, right. All right, so real okay. quick. So no, I mean, I'm gonna address that, but it's okay. So there's the, the starving artist myth. You, you've all heard of it, right? So it's, it's based on you know, one of the books by Henry Merger in the like, 1800s, right? And then La Boheme by Puccini was made into a thing. So there's this myth that if you're an artist, you're gonna starve, right? And I think when I look at money and art, the most determining factor is your genre. If you're a poet, you're probably not gonna make a living. I used to say no poet has ever made a living, but then somebody came up to me and said, I know one slam poet who makes a living. So I'm like, all right, there's one guy. <laughs> you know, maybe there's maybe it's a dozen, maybe I missed 11 other people. So if you're a poet, you're probably gonna teach or do something else, right? In different genres, like if you're a street performer, you're basically gonna make a living, all right? If you're a stand-up comic, it's a little bit harder, okay? But there are certain fields that the society values more and gives more money to. That's just how it is, okay? So then it's kind of tricky because sometimes you don't even pick your genre. Like you fall in love with something and then you're like, well, how do I monetize this, all right? How do I do this? There's many, many ways. Like I have a radio show called uh, Talking Stick at Radio Free Brooklyn. I do a lot of shows. I'm, I used to, I, I didn't have a smartphone until what, like this year, right? And then I was like, I want a smartphone, and now I'm like fucking addicted to it, right? Like, you know, <laughs> social media and stuff, right? Now I'm in virtual reality all the time. And that's a problem because now I have to go through two realities to get to reality. <laughs> I gotta go through virtual reality, then I have to go through the society zeitgeist, you know, thing, and my own thing to just get down to, I'm gonna meditate, and then just, see what happens. So here's the tools I use to 
deal with hecklers. That's, that's what I call them. I call them hecklers, like your parents or your own voice in your head or society, tribal stuff. I pretend that there's a waterfall, a very powerful waterfall. You ever put your head underneath a waterfall or a really powerful shower? You can't even think. You're just giggling and laughing. So when somebody comes up to me and is heckling, I pretend there's a giant waterfall between me and the other person. Your boss comes up and you have to move the, what? You can barely hear them. Yeah, okay. Wash away that neurosis just to get to zero. Okay. Now, are you scared of it's kind of deep. Are you scared of engaging in making a bridge to the audience? Like are you willing to you know, like a lot of artists are shy and introverted or black sheep say. So it's like like I used to be really shy. Obviously, I, I'm cured of that. <laughs> but I used to be crazy shy, right? Because I grew up in Connecticut, and like there were two Asian families. That's it, the whole town. So it took me, and they used to make fun of me, and I'd go hide in a bush, like literally hide in a bush in the park and read a novel, you know, for like two days, and then I finish the novel, and I'm like, shit, I gotta go deal with it. So <clears throat> here's the thing: Do you do you want to change? That's the thing. That, like one of the things is. If you're not happy with where you are in your art, do you want to change? This is outside of society's crazy, you know? It's just like for you. You don't have the answer right now, or you can, but do you want to change? Um, not necessarily, I mean, I'm very happy with where my art is going, it's always evolving, but in terms of like business and like the next mm -hmm. level, I think it's intimidating because there's a lot of pressures. Like I had a play produced, but I never wrote another one. Like that kind of thing of like scared of continuing and like is building. it like a fear of failure, a fear of success? I think so. What's underneath the fear of failure? What's underneath the fear of success? Like imagine something failed really bad. Like everybody hated it. Your partner left you. I've had this happen. Your partner left you. I had people walk out of the show. I've never had that many. Really? People. Like four people would walk out of every show. Wow. Right? This is terrible. Did you write another play? Well, my friend Andy, he showed me a gay playwright's uh, website, and the guy had posted all the hate mail. Wow. I, and you know, he's gay, so like, it's really vicious shit, you know, wow. before the end of it. And I'm like, wow, that guy, that's kind of cool that somebody hates my show, you know? I turned it around, so, so if, <laughs> or rather Andy helped. So what, what I would say is, just imagine, what's the worst that can ever happen to you, right? Like, like if you're gonna commit suicide, right? Right, this is from Teal, another new age thing. Um, if you're gonna commit suicide, then it's like, well, how are you gonna do it? All right, what's your funeral gonna be like? What music's gonna be playing? Who's gonna actually come to your funeral? What kind of food are you gonna serve? You what are the people gonna, what's that? You should raise tea. Yeah, like, like what, how hard, like, like just imagine the worst thing possible that can happen while you're in the middle of the winter now, okay? Okay? AI? Yeah. Oh, you want an answer? No, I'm I mean, just saying that you imagine well, it. Well, you mentioned the season, so then I would think of, like, you know, being, um, living on the street and freezing to death, but okay. the title of your workshop, you know, losing your mind, I feel like that could be a very real fear for people who get very inside their work. Mm -hmm. so, but it's, this is about you. It's like personally for you. Like what? What's the worst it can be? And then it's like, do you want to change? You know, do you want? You can continue on the path you're going because you know this is a two-hour workshop. That's it. Or you can say you can confront your fear and say this is like, you know, and I've done it by building myself up. I'm great or diminishing the audience. Or I did this other thing where. I'm talking to this great performer, Pepe, and I said, how do you do such great shows? He goes, a hundred people come to my shows, and they're all breathing in different rhythms. He goes, I can't breathe a hundred different ways, so they all have to come to me. 
And once they're all breathing in the same rhythm, then I can take them where I want them to go. So those are the ways I deal with it, and it seems like your issue is reaching a broader audience, right? Or reaching more people. No, the problem's myself. Everybody's problems <laughs> themselves. <laughs> I mean. So, you know, it's not, you can't really give a yes or no answer to, do you want to change? Because the desire might be there, but the the ability to do that might not be, you know? Okay, look. I, I had a partner and my best friend told me when I was like 30, he said, you have no empathy. I was like, wow, it must be true. They both said no empathy. <laughs> oh, no. So then I started reading books on empathy, magazine articles, and then I learned empathy. I learned how to look in somebody's face and see what they're feeling and to have empathy because it's a social skill. There's skill. There's skill. You can learn a skill. Anything a human being has done, you can learn. I mean. There's some things that are physically impossible. You're probably not going to be prima ballerina, you know, at this age, you know, just <laughs> break your toe and stuff. But it's a skill. These things are not, it's not a mystery. These are social skills. Now you have the internet, you go with social skills. Learn empathy, you know, facial expression, <laughs> body language, mirror. Empathy hmm, Pause. Do the same breath that they're doing. Okay. We got way off topics. All right. But we, we can do more. Um, so what were we focusing on? Oh, the one of chattering mine. Okay, I got a couple more things. Um, is there anything uh, anybody wants to hear about, or we can keep on going? Anybody else know? Okay. Um, so, when I was first doing comedy, right? You go, you have to go to every comedy club, and there and. My, my metaphors are like nuts, right? You have to crack this nut, then you're in, you pass. And they never tell you passed at the club. They're just like, well, you can come any, like, you know, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday from midnight to two and do a set, right? So it's frightening, because I would sit there and the manager or the owner would have all the power, right? I felt like they had too much power. I'm like, So I, I asked another comedian, what should I do? And he goes, well, first of all, no one show is going to make or break you. This is not life or death, right? You're going to have hundreds, maybe thousands of shows in your lifetime. So don't worry about it too much in that way, right? So it's not going to make or break you. And so how I dealt with it is, I said, three days a week, I'm going to go hang out at these clubs. You know, Monday, what was it? It was Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, I'm going to go hang out at these clubs because you have to be seen. If that goes back to go to parties, be seen. Oh shit, oh Andy, how you doing? I haven't seen you forever. Oh, I got this thing. It's, it's about connection, you know? And as artists, sometimes we don't want to connect because our thing is so introverted. So it, it, artists are, a lot of artists are very smart and very shy and painful. It's, it's almost like your, uh, your meter goes to like 100, you know? And most people's meter goes to like 10, okay? So your meter can be, so what I did is I said, three days a week, I'm hanging out at these clubs. And I'm going to have a comedy buddy. I'm going to go with a friend. So I'm not just like sitting there drinking at the bar like a lonely, miserable loser. <laughs> Even though most comics are lonely, miserable. <laughs> comedy is like the darkest. In here. So what, what I would say to anybody is get, a com or get an art buddy, right, and say, you know, I had a lot of time, because that's what I wanted. But like once a week, twice a week, I'd say twice a week, because it's more of a commitment. Say every Monday and Wednesday, I'm gonna go to these galleries, or every Monday and Wednesday, we're gonna go to here, and go with an art buddy. It's like going to the gym, okay? This is like, like when I do an open mic, right? I look at it like it's the gym. I'm going to the gym, I'm working out this, I'm gonna, I'm gonna work on my left hand, and I'm gonna do some cardio, whatever. It's like, you're doing it, because it's a muscle and you're working it out so that by the time you're here performing, whatever, doing a workshop, you know what you're doing. So think about where, so let's say two times a week. So two times a week, write down where you would go and then write down who you'd go with. So there you go.
So I want to take a little break, and then we're going to come back. But here's the thing: just you know, hopefully we're all artists, you know, or you're interested in artists, or you're dating somebody who's an artist who forced you to come to this workshop. <laughs> <laughs> so just everybody mingle for like 10 or 15 minutes and try to meet like two or three people. Okay, so just say hi. I'm William. I'm a performer. This is where I hang out and try to try to get to know a couple of people. So take take like ten or fifteen minutes and actually stand up and walk around with somebody and say hi. Hi, I'm Sam. Rebecca, nice to meet you. I uh, I do No, that's like I I know so. Hey, welcome back to part two. Give yourselves a round of applause. We're pretending to show the workshop. All right. So, um, during the break, I went around and I asked people, like, is there an issue you want to hear about that I haven't covered yet? So, some people said um, doubt and faith, having faith in your projects and doubting it. We can talk about day job. We can talk about business issues and then we'll also perspectives. So, and the starving artist. Yes. I want to know, as an artist, you're all very emotional people, or it seems yeah. to be that way. And I'm curious, like, how you deal with that when you're working with artists who are emotional, you know, and you have to be able to kind of deal with your ups and downs, or if you have them. I personally feel like a manic sometimes, of being, I feel like confident, and then I'm doubting, and then I'm sad, and I'm happy, I'm laughing, I'm crying, like, I don't. I want okay. the balance. I got, I got. Um, so I'm in southern France. I'm in Avignon, two France, beautiful places. And I just finished doing a show, and this woman comes up to me and goes, um, you, you have uh, an interesting life. It's like uh, higher highs and lower lows. I go, what do you mean by that? She goes, well, you know, it's higher highs, lower It's like a roller coaster, right? So. One of the definitions of art, well, okay, that's like another thing, but all right. Well, if you look in the dictionary, def one of the definitions of art is to create. Another one is with skill, okay? That's what it is. 
you're on a roller coaster ride because a lot of times you're doing this with blind faith. You, you're not going to get any reward until you're famous. Then everybody would be like, oh, man, she, she's great. She used to, you know, come here and do her thing, you know. Like, if you go to San Francisco, Robin Williams started at this club, every single club, right? If he was unknown, no. So here's how I deal with my emotions. First of all, I believe your friends are like mirrors, okay? So one of the benefits of having friends is they're like mirrors to you. They, they show you your, your blind spots, okay? They can also like, say you're going manic, you call up your friend. Oh, okay, also, first of the thing about manic is that a lot of times it's seasonal, okay? Because, you know, you get more sunlight during, you know, spring and fall. So do you have a solid group of friends? Me specifically? Yeah. I have multiple groups of friends. For different, like you compartmentalize yeah, for different things. Yeah. Okay. But do you, like if things were, you know, like if you're going, I don't even know off the rails is the right term, but if, like for your emotions, like who can you, can you turn to a certain group of people and talk about your emotions? My family, actually. Wow, okay, great. That's, yeah. It's not my experience for me, but it's a great, family. Yeah, right. and my partner. Yeah. Okay, so, what about you? I would say that, first of all, another definition of art is, uh, Art, art is an expression of self, okay? So something's coming through you, and then it's really hard not to get attached to the art. I think there's a part in some people's art project where the thing comes alive, okay? It's almost like you're breathing life into it. Then the thing comes alive. Like, I have this friend, Howard. He's a great choreographer. I go, how do you do it? How do you tap the unconscious? We'll get into that. And then how do you deal with it? He goes, well, there's this a point where the, 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 the piece comes alive, and then all you have to do is follow it. So with your emotions, many, many artists are more sensitive than the, whatever you want to call it, non-artists or normal people. <laughs> You, you, <laughs> civilians. <laughs> you ever think you're? Civilians. You ever think you're sane? You ever think you're sane in an insane world? Round of applause if you think you're sane, and the, the whole world around you is so great, right? I'm gonna change you ever, sides. Yeah. I'm going with that one. You ever been disassociate, where where you feel like your 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 body, you're leaving your body, and you're not part of your body? Okay. So then the question is, this is like the extreme version of emotions. What do you do if you're sane in an insane world, right? There's a matrix happening, there it just is. So for me, it's like, number one is survive. Number two, make yourself happy. Number three, do your art. And then I have this rule where I go, do not argue with the brainwashed. Right? If somebody's a Trump supporter, I don't argue. If somebody has a giant American flag outside their house, I don't go hang at your house. It's one of those things. So, what I would say is, there's great things about having a circle of friends, and then there's mixed things about having an art tribe. I, I consider art tribe bigger than a little circle of your friends. The, there's certain things you can't do individually. Like, it's very hard to make a film individually. It's very hard to do architecture individually. Two most expensive art forms. So <laughs> you can build an art tribe, or you can join a pre-existing art tribe, but then you have to be worried because the art tribe has rules and regulations that, and unspoken things that they want to put you in a certain role. So with most families, maybe not your family, but with your art tribe, your circle, or your, your family, it's often you grow, you change, and the group of people do not change. So then what do you do? Like everybody in the group has to change or change their view of you, or they're stick, keeping you stuck in that certain role. Okay. Similar to this is, we're going to talk about day job, and how to get a day job, and then how to get rid of a day job. Okay. That's, that's what I look at. 
Okay, so there's, in the reading and whatever my experience, I, I think you want to find a day job that doesn't drain you. Okay, that, that seems basic. If if you're going for an art form, you, you don't want to have at the end of the day, like it's five o'clock, whatever. You have to go home and do more work for these people. Like, what is that about? Also, be wary of being trapped in socializing with your day job people, right? Let's go out for a drink. You're like, well, I could go out for a drink with these people that I would have nothing to do with, except I have to make a living with you, or I can go home and do my art, or sit in a room by myself. Okay, so so be careful because it's even worse with the tech jobs because they, you know, they have a fucking cafeteria built in. They never want you to leave. It's like minimum security prison. All right. So the starving artist myth. Let's get back to that. Um, and it deals with the Protestant work ethic and then the Confucius work ethic. And if there's any Jewish people we can talk after, because I'm not sure exactly what your work ethic is. Well, there's other people too. Um, why? Well, that's just what it is. These are just facts, I don't know. Um, okay, so the Protestant work ethic is, well, it's probably a little more Catholic, but all right, you gotta work hard so you get into heaven, okay? So basically, yeah. <coughs> Implicit in that is artists are not working hard. You're in a play. The word play, it's in the language. You're playing an instrument. You're not working hard. You're playing. Even sports, you're playing ball. You know, People get mad at like the sports people. They're like making millions of dollars a year. Like, well, how much is the owner making? Yeah. The owner's making like a billion. You know, you're worried about a million? That's like nothing. So be aware that there's this Protestant work ethic, especially in the Northeast. Where <laughs> it is. There's a Protestant work ethic where you work hard so you're going to have and then, you know, blah, blah, blah. The Confucius work ethic, the Chinese thing, Asian thing, is a little bit different. They're like, screw heaven. You work hard so your family gets ahead. Your family gets ahead, then the village gets ahead. Then the village gets said, then the nation, and then, you know, that thing is way out of there. Okay, so with the starving artist myth, don't believe that. If you're an artist, you may be starving, but you ever think, like, I want to get an artist grant? Like, nod your head if you ever think you want to get an artist grant. They provide that. You can get $198 a month. It's called food stamps. <laughs> While we still have a democratic, you know, you can still, you get food stamps, you can shop at Whole Foods, that's amazing. I <laughs> get like Alaskan Sam, you can shop at a green market, it's food stamp. Welfare is a little bit trickier because that's on your record forever. So day job, get a job that doesn't drain you. If you have a job that drains you, look for another job. Yeah. All right. So now, doubt and faith to businesses. Okay, so business, uh, somebody, yeah, back there. I have a question. The, um, the idea of like, you have a, a day job that drains you, leave it. I guess I'm wondering about, like, I want to have a job during the day that does actually align with my values. Sure. <laughs> but yeah, it's draining, it's really hard. It is really hard to be doing that kind of work during the day and to come home and do art, and I haven't figured out goes back to the uh, that goes back to neurosis is always a substitute for legitimate suffering it's like are you willing to go through the legitimate suffering for the art oh so, so you're saying your day job is like some socially yeah, that's a hard job. You know what the burnout rate on a social worker is? Jesus. 
So, so what? So what? So let's talk about your martyr situation. Do you have a martyr complex in your family or with you? Do you feel like you should? First of all, if something is not self-sustaining, right? This is how I'm looking at it. Yeah. And being too forward, being a do. All right. If it's too, if if you cannot sustain it, if it's not self-sustainable, eventually you're going to burn out. Yeah, here's here's my take on it. Um, if you don't mind me asking, how much do you pay for rent a month? You know, it's personal. You pay over a thousand. Uh, good for you. I I pay it really little. But there, you know, there's communes that are like four hundred dollars a month. Okay, but then you're like living with ten people, and you have a very small place. There's there's ways. If for me, it's more about priority. I wanted to, I, I lived in the village, I lived in a legalized squad, my, you know, my maintenance, because we owned the whole floor, was never more than 500 bucks, okay? So, but I had that kind of situation. So, you know rent is too damn high? Yeah, okay. I'm left of him. I don't think people should have to pay rent. The Indians didn't pay rent. Yeah, how many years ago was that? All right, with that given, you're like, well, how does that relate to me? If you have a day job that doesn't drain you, that's self-sustaining, I feel the next step for your, for art is that you transition out of the day job. You know, if you if you want to commit to your art and if it's a sustainable thing, some things are really hard art forms, like poetry, performance art, dance. Those are like the, the you know. I knew a woman who was in uh, Trisha Brown. Right? One of the best modern dance companies. She was making five fifty a week. This is a woman who danced since she was like four until like twenty five. Right? So it's different genres. So that's what I would say about day job is first of all to realize you're in a you're in a day job that there's a high burnout rate, social worker. So you're eventually, you know, unless you beat the odds, you're gonna you're gonna be burning out. So then for me it's like a lot of social workers go into administration so they can stay in that field of helping longer. That's what it is. And maybe I'm wrong. Tell me after the show. All right, so that's, that's what I would say to you. The, the other part of the day job thing is some people say, well, I want to get a day job. I want to get a day job that um, is in my field. Okay? So like, you know, so if you're a fine artist, maybe you want to get a job at a gallery, right? So I would say, People are mixed in the literature, and I, I'm kind of mixed, but I would say as long as the thing doesn't drain you, you know, at five o'clock it ends. Yes. Um, I just want to add a little sure. nuance to that kind sure. of thing about social work because I'm also a social worker, and and I do feel like some jobs allow you to create art that, that where you understand the world, you understand people, you're constantly immersed in amazing stories and situations. So I just think. It's not exactly like, are you drained, are you not drained? It's also what's enriching your your wisdom and your contribution and your understanding of like lots of different people. So I, I just don't want people to think all, all social workers are pathetic and bedraggled and no, whatever else. Oh my god. Yeah. So, I think social workers and teachers are like heroic. Yeah. You know? So I don't, I don't want to give, like this is more about I call it protecting the baby, okay? So, so if, if you put your art as your first or second thing, you know, relationship, and then, you know, your art, I do everything I can do to protect the baby. There are many forces in society that are trying to make you feel like what you're doing is not legit, okay? Uh, I think it goes back to the Greeks, I think it goes back to Hephaestus, I think it goes back to all that stuff. But, Social workers are great. I'm just saying, for the long term, is this going to be sustainable for you, or do you have passion for something else? So if your passion is greater for the, uh, for art or whatever you're doing with the artistic process, then 
I'm saying for sure go to for that. So this is the story of how I got out of my day job, right? I used to keep a log of every penny I made, literally every penny I made, you know, doing street shows. And one day I came in with a bag of money, coins, dollars, poured it on the thing, and it was 75 bucks. And my boss looks at me, and I was making $60 at the coffee shop. He goes, how many shows was that? I go, three. And then two weeks later, I quit. So I consciously transitioned out of my day job because I didn't like it. There are certainly people who like their day job, and there's certainly artists who are very successful after they retire, but it's very hard to do your art and also have, you know, at least eight hours where you're working. Because if you think you're awake 16 hours a day, right, that's half your waking hours. And then you don't include travel, now you're tired. So maybe it's even more than eight, maybe it's 10 hours a day. So what I'm saying with artists is, it's, that's a personal decision whether you want to transition out of your day job and get something that's less draining. Certainly there's jobs that are draining that don't get valued and paid as much in this society, but I'm addressing more being an artist. So, there you go. There's a couple more things you can deal with. This is a tough one. Uh, it's about doubt and faith. You know, a lot of times, um, I, I don't know if I'm going to be able to finish a project. One, one of the signs I'm in a really good project is that I don't know if I can complete it because it's, it's asking and demanding everything I've ever learned before to complete the project. So what I do is I just try to get the ball rolling, right? I try to take the smallest step because I feel like once you take the first step, that's 50% of the fear is gone because you, you, you've done it and it's not as big as your fears and not the same exact thing. I think 50% of the effort is just doing the thing the first time and then the other 50 is just continuing it. So Hemingway talked about a little bit, like never, never finish a day where the well is empty. Okay, always finish on a high note where you know what the next thing coming is so that you can read up to that point and you have momentum. I think momentum is crazy important. I think it's like, I liken it to a wave. You know, you wanna catch a wave and you wanna ride it for as long as possible. So I've, I've gone years where I didn't produce that much work and it's tough because you think, I thought I would never get out of it and then I came out of it, but it's a long, long cycle you know yeah I, for me now it's more about truth and courage so a couple more yeah sure there's a writer i love i like a lot who said that when you're writing your story is like you're a deformed baby so like you really really care about your story but all you're going to see are all its problems and that you sort of have to live with your deformed baby until it's ready to go out to the world. I don't know what to say. <laughs> <laughs> That's sort of in response to doubt and faith is how you have to like love it while dealing with like how it's going to be really difficult. We can talk about first drafts. You know, that's kind of important. Yeah. Um, my friend, he calls it like the first time you do something, you're just, I'm gonna just do it and it's gonna be fumbly dumbly and you know, I'm gonna muddle through it like, and it won't be exactly, but I'll get a glimpse of it. And and then you you do it again, you know? Do you guys ever have like a fear of a, like perfectionism? Mm -hmm. Yeah, perfection. <laughs> so how I kind of semi-cure that is, um, I realize very few things are written in stone. You know, so I could always go back and rewrite it. And the, the perfect thing is, they talk about like original sin, and I have a kid, so I saw him being born. So I was like, this, that's bullshit. There's no original sin. I call it original trauma, right? Um. Like there's, you're born, you're happy, whatever, and then some trauma happens, and it's like a hurdle you can't get past, right? 
you can't get past that hurdle. So any little kind of imperfection or flaw in your persona, you know, persona is Greek for mask, any, any kind of imperfection in that throws you off because it's like you're, you're a balloon and your bubble is being burst, you know? So perfectionism is just, I call it like now, like being human, you know? Like, I'm gonna, you know, the second play I wrote, I think I did like 14 drafts or something, you know? So you're gonna get some stuff in the first one, maybe you only get one character out of it, that's okay, you know? But it's taken me a while to, to realize I'm not gonna get everything on the first draft or even the second one, so, yeah. All right, so we had one more question about time management, and then we can do more, and then loss of perspective is interesting, too. Well, I, I think the loss of perspective thing goes back to uh, like having a, a tight group of friends who show you your, your, your blind spots, and the, the problem with being an artist is at five o'clock, a whistle doesn't go off and your artist day ends. Like, since I was a teenager, every single day of my life, I thought about art. Every single, single day of my life, I thought about how can I make this better? How can I... So the loss of perspective thing, I feel, is... You ever do Google Earth? You pull out? You pull way out on your whatever iPad or whatever it is, and then you can see the perspective from a giant perspective. The problem with our job is it doesn't just end. There's you're constant. You ever been wired and tired? Your brain is constantly, constantly going. Yeah. So I think they're cutting those off. I think the mic went out. Yeah. So loss of perspective. Um, I would say have a tight group of people that can tell you when you're off base and, lo and lose perspective. Um, and then we have time management. We can do a couple more things or we can hang out and drink camera uh, line. So, okay, so time management. I, I think, well, we, we covered deadline a little bit, but I think one of the most important things is like the day before you go to sleep, like if I'm gonna to work tomorrow, is to make your to-do list the day before. Because if you make it the day before, then your unconscious has a chance to go through your next day's to-do list and complete some tasks while you're unconscious. So, here's how I tap the unconscious, or there, there are many ways. I have a friend who's a painter and he he turns on every radio, every TV, every computer in his house at full volume. So it's almost like overload, right? Everything's coming at him. Then he gets really stoned. Then he paints. And he's a really good painter. He's in the Rothko Turner style of painting. I think there's basically two ways to tap the unconscious that I've uncovered. One I call like an immersive surrender. You're overwhelming yourself with stimulus, you know. Like psychedelics or stimulus come from everywhere. And then you have no choice but to, it's like doing an end run, to go running around the conscious mind, right? What is the conscious mind good at? Editing and filing, okay? What is the unconscious good at? It's everything. It's a giant ocean. So how I tap the unconscious is, you ever get so stoned you can't get any more stoned? <laughs> so then you puff a little bit more and you're like, it's a waste of pot. I do that so I don't think. The other way people do it, and it's, it's definitely slower in one way, is kind of a deep meditative state where you ever been like in a deep forest or in like a 10 day or two week silent retreat? Nod your head if you've been in a silent retreat. That's some crazy shit. Because your brain starts like to chatter to other sides of your brain, right? 
So a deep immersive thing where basically you don't want to engage your self-consciousness, like Dionysus, you get outside your consciousness, and sometimes you leave your body. You know? So that's how I do it. Other, other people do it this way where you, you close your eyes and you just have like a small filter open and you see shadows and trails and ghost trails of movement and color, and then you can follow the trails with your mind. I just read this thing on Bowie, because you know, he's everywhere. How he cuts sentences and then combines them in odd ways, and then that sparks another thing. Sometimes people do free write, sometimes people do free speaking. I have this rule when I'm on stage, this is my time, I have total freedom. I'm not gonna edit myself. <laughs> so I don't care enough to edit myself. You know. So what I would say is tell the truth, speak from the heart, go deeper, mix the drugs. Because you don't want to just be preaching to the choir. And most importantly, have fun. Okay? Be an artist, don't lose fun. Thanks. Uh, if, if I don't have your email, come up and send email. And thanks for coming. Thank you at Blue Stockings.